Uh, morning, everyone. Glad you all made it out. And I'm going to get right into this and get going. A little bit about my background. Um, I'm uh, the holder of several titles uh, inside of this whole thing that we're talking about. Uh, my title is Ahati, the one who strikes. And uh, I'm going to do a little striking today, but just with the mental portion of uh, what's going on this morning. Um, for a little more than 40 years, I've been uh, using and experiencing several entheogens. Uh, some of them you would call the classical entheogens, others are more exotic. Um, today I'm going to be speaking about hydocilocybin uh, and a little bit about the acacias. Uh, hydocilocybin in the 20 to 30 gram range of dried psilocybin. Uh, that's a little more than John Hopkins talks about as far as high dose. That's a little more than Terrence McKenna talks about as the heroic dose. But it's about, for me and many whom I work with, about pushing the envelope of cognition. Being able to have access to the hyperdimensional realms of legend. Not just to take our foot and put it in the water but to go out into the ocean where there is no horizon, where you have no choice. Um, most people know about Iboka, or what they call Ibogaine in dealing with Africa, and they say that's it. But um, I got a chance to speak for a minute because a couple of people didn't show up yesterday, <coughs> and it was on, uh, it was basically talking about Zulu ethnobotany and power plants. Now, just in the Zulu alone, they have over 300 different types of psychoactive entheogenic plants that they use in their uh, pharmacopoeia. That's just South Africa. That's not North Africa, East, West, Central Africa, and Africa is a big place. The European powers on purpose disguise the map to make Africa smaller. You could take Europe, the United States, uh, several other <laughs> countries and continents and put inside of Africa. Uh, it's a very, very large place. You could take the United States and put it in Africa and lose it. You, couldn't, you, could, walk, you could drive a truck or an airplane around and not find the United States in Africa. That's how large it is. It's the largest habitable land on Earth. And uh, when we talk about Pangaea, or we talk about when the, planet, um, when the planet had all the continents butting one another, Africa and South America butted together. So the same, many of the same plants that are in South America are in Africa. I haven't checked on uh, Bonasteria's copy as far as the vine and the other constituents that go into ayahuasca there in Africa because I wasn't really particularly interested in, uh, in those plants at the time. But so much ayahuasca and ayahuasca and ayahuasca is becoming the most prominent thing. I'm sure I'll go somewhere in the uh, rainforest and find some of those plants. So next time I go, I'll start looking because psilocybin, which I'm going to talk about today, the mushroom, the magic mushroom, and it is magic. Um, ayahuasca may be medicine or it is medicine. You call it the medicine, but that uh, equates sickness, uh, meaning that, oh, I have to take the medicine meaning that I'm sick. Well, I don't consider myself sick. Uh, mushrooms are magical. It is the quintessential hallucinogen of this planet. It is a exo knowledge based organic technology. And I don't want it to butt heads with anything else saying that, oh, this is the best, but it is the oldest, it is the first. How do we know that? Because it is whole within itself. All of the others are alchemies. They come along with the domestication of fire. They come along with the building of pots because you can't boil water if you don't have a pot to be able to put this plant in and that plant in and mix this one and mix that one. No, when you're walking, on the grasslands of Africa and the Sahara many hundreds of thousands of years ago and you're looking for food in the hunting and gathering 
phase of human beings, you had a mushroom sitting on top of the cow pie. And as Terrence McKenna said, in the natural environment, it could be on a 12 inch stalk with the cap on it the size of a dinner plate. So if you're walking and you encounter this and you're looking for food, you're gonna try it at least once. <laughs> and that's what they did. And of course, you know, we understand the classical literature and sayings from YouTube and reading different types of uh, literature that it has three levels of ingestion, which are uh, the first level, of course, is visual acuity. It creates better vision. You can see farther if you're in a hunting and gathering situation and there's a flower that you want or that you like, that you want to eat, and it's 200 yards away, you probably can't see it. But if you take the psilocybin, you can see that flower at a greater distance. So it's an adaptive advantage when you're trying to find out what food is in your environment and the ability to be able to see that food so that you can eat, get more constituents in your body, pass the genes on to the next generation. It's an adaptive advantage. It's also an adaptive advantage when we left the trees of the great forest of Africa and went into something that had never been on earth before because of climactic changes, and that was grassland, where you had large predators. It wasn't like the forest where food was available by just reaching out and picking it off the tree and eating it in a mono diet. We were forced out into the grasslands, and being forced out into the grasslands, that means you're, the trees aren't there, the trees are receding because Africa over a period of a million and a half years became drier and drier and drier these grasslands came. So it was an adaptive advantage for uh, the humanoids who were upright as opposed to the contemporary humanoid types. Homo habilis, Homo erectus started to look up over the grass. Those that were down low couldn't look over the grass, couldn't see the lions, couldn't see the large predators got ate up. But the second level of ingestion of the psilocybin is that it is a true aphrodisiac. It's not like what most people or, uh, talk about as far as aphrodisiac, it gives genital itching, which means, oh well, it's itching, so I might as well use it. <laughs> no, it causes CNS arousal, and in the male, that is erection. It is an antsy feeling. You've taken psilocybin, many of you, it's hard to go to sleep. So you're up. In the mail, you have an erection, you might as well use it. <laughs> and then the third level is that it imparts a mystery. A mystery that is just as much a mystery today in 2013 as it was 20,000 years ago, 30,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago. Psilocybin is whole within itself. And it gives you the ability to be able to take enough of it that you get the constituents in your body to saturate the serotonergic system. You can't do that with Iboka. Folks talk about high dose ayahuasca. I don't know because each brew of ayahuasca is, uh, according to the literature is different. There's no standard. You don't know how much is in the vine. You don't know how long old the vine is. So it's pretty difficult to try to drink a couple of gallons of the stuff to be able to get enough of it in you to have actual access to the realms that I'm talking about. Iboka, Ibogaine, of which most in the literature associate with, Af uh, associate with Africa, you have to take enough Ibogaine to kill yourself to be able to have access. What people get when they take Ibogaine is a tourist dose because dealing in the, the, the West and the sensibility of clinicians and people who are in the um, medical field and people in the, uh, the field of psychology and things like this is that the first thing is safety. We don't want anybody uh, dying on the couch. We don't want anybody, you know, uh, because this is bad publicity, it's bad for the, the group, it's, it's bad for the tribe. But in the traditional setting in Gabon with the Bwiti, that's not the, that's not the first Consideration. The first consideration is getting you in there, getting you there, so that you can do the work that you need to do. And they keep feeding, you, feeding it to you, and they keep feeding it to you, and they keep feeding it to you until the elders looking at you say, okay, they're there, let's back off. 
<laughs> and people die because the ever-present specter of death is always with you. I mean, people talk about Carlos Castaneda and they talk about, well, his anthropology wasn't that great and he was using too much datura and those type of things. But the things that he was talking about were clearly on the money, whether he gleaned it from other literature, whatever he did, when he put it in those first few books, he got kind of really wild the last few, but uh, you know, the first few books, a separate reality and stuff like that, that's the shit. <laughs> Psilocybin at the range of ingestion that I'm talking about is, you can't be at the party. Because when I read about what people are doing with psilocybin, they're taking sub-threshold party doses. Because you can party. You're in a house with three or four of your friends. You all split an eighth, smoke some, smoke some weed, look at Bart Simpson on the TV, laugh. You know, I can tell when a person has got it, and a lot of people uh, are faking the funk. They've taken just enough so that they can say I've taken it and be part of the group. Oh yeah, I've taken psilocybin. Oh yeah, I've smoked DMT. Oh yeah, I've taken ayahuasca. Oh yeah, I did this and that and this and that. But they've taken such a small dose that they have absolutely no idea what this thing is in the higher doses. And I'm not speaking this out of arrogance because when I was in Australia and Rack, <laughs> Rack probably was at the party, he's not here, but um, I did an interview with him and I talked about uh, uh, 25 grams of dry psilocybin, 30 grams uh, taken ingesting that, and people in, uh, around the internet, well, this guy's arrogant, you know, he's talking, he's badass because he's saying he can take 20 and 30 grams and stuff like that. But no, we have uh, housewives who are taking 22 and 25 grams. We have people in their 70s taking these. We have uh, people who are 18, because we wait to the age of majority, I'm not a person who is um, irresponsible. We have a protocol with it. But the thing is, and the difference is between the two, uh, ayahuasca and psilocybin, is that ayahuasca is social. It's part of a group experience. It's sitting around the campfire and singing the songs and supporting one another. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a beautiful ceremony. But psilocybin is not, not like that. Psilocybin is the journey of the alone into the alone. It's kind of like the way I was trained. It's kind of like the difference between the Jedi and the Sith. The Jedi have the Jedi temple and the Jedi start as little children and it's a group of them and Yoda comes and says, you know, put your little mask on and I'm gonna teach you how to fight and things like that. No, but the Sith is different. They have the rule of two. The rule of two is that there's a master and there's an apprentice. Meaning that if you're a Sith Lord, the job of your apprentice is to learn everything you, you have to offer and once they've done that is to kill you. So they don't want 30 disciples walking around, you know, possibly at some point in time going to chop them with a lightsaber. So they only have one so they can watch them. <laughs> and I'm not saying that we're practicing the art of the Sith, but I'm just talking about the rule of two. It is the journey of the alone into the alone, placing your power, your courage against that which is in the darkness. Meaning that it is alone. It's kind of like I was talking yesterday, the journey to the center of the earth, the book. And when those people who came after Arne Saknesim went down into the center of the earth and followed his trail, when they, got, when they got about 10 minutes in, in the dark in those caves, they said, do you know that this guy came down here by himself? Down here by himself without anybody else? Because if there is anyone else there, the mask is always there. Now the doses that I'm talking about in a 20 to 30 gram range don't adhere to the regular protocols of, of uh, 
hallucinogenic use. It's, it's different. Set and setting doesn't make any difference. You can be any place. <laughs> you want to be safe. You don't want to be standing out in traffic and take 25 gram. <laughs> but, but it doesn't matter if you got Frankenstein on the wall. It doesn't matter if, you know, uh, it doesn't matter because all that's going to change. You're not going to be in the place that you start out eating in because all that's going to change. It's going to set its own agenda. And each and everything that you can imagine is there. And many things that you cannot imagine. I have a few slides that I'm going to go through. This is a four hour PowerPoint program. I'm not going to go through all the slides. I'm going to just show a few pictures because basically these are pictures. Basically these are pictures. I think PowerPoint, uh, power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. <laughs> it gives people who uh, don't have a command of their subject, the ability to read off the PowerPoint program, and uh, that's the way they do it. So it is an apprenticeship program. It is a solitary vocation inside of hyperspace. There's no one there to help. There is no grasping of the edge of the cliff. It is, once you eat it, there's nothing you can do. You're there. So when people talk about, you know, well, I was just so amazed with three grams, you know, uh, yes, three grams is amazing on psilocybin, but it's several thousand orders of magnitude away from 20 grams. It's different. The veil has been pushed aside. Stuff is floating through the room. You floating through the room. Far away planets and jungles. Encounters with not just machine elves, but in the insectoids. I have a lot of difficulty with the praying mantises. They're just, you know, they, you know, they give me a lot of problems. <laughs> And the thing about it is, it's not all love and bubbles and, you know, I, I listened to some of the trip descriptions from DMT. Oh, I smoked DMT and I felt the ultimate love and, you know, the elves were coming through, you know, the munchkins and things like that. That is not what is encountered in the 20th to 30 gram realm. You may see the predator walk through the room being chased by one of the aliens. <laughs> or anything else in real time, access, understanding the realms of power in the literature of legend. <coughs> the Olympians, the Asgardians, the Yoruba, the Akan, the dream time of the Aborigine. And it's not just that, even, even dealing with the acacias, it's, it's monstrous doses that they take. I'm not gonna read a lot, but I just wanted to read something real quick in dealing with African entheogens because I didn't want it to be just all my talking. I wanted to read this about the Maasai warriors of Tanzania, and they utilized the acacias. Acacia nilotica, mimosa hostilis, several acacias for just about every single aspect of warfare and battle and fighting. And I'll get a little bit into the Japanese too because they were taking mushrooms for battle, fighting, and martial arts. Ninjutsu came out of the Amanita Pantherina mushroom, the art of invisibility. So all of those things that you see in the old 1985 ninja movies, you know, where the guy jumps to the top of the wall, that's all under the influence of the entheogens. You know, Kung Fu, the Shaolin Temple with Cain and the rest of the martial artists, that's all mushroom. Shaolin means young pine forest, where the mushrooms grow. 
So the Maasai warriors of Tanzania were known for their aggressiveness and violence, which overcame the afraid near tribes. Just reached the proper age to become a warrior, the young Maasai submit to an initiation of military and religious nature. And in that occasion, they, are also, they also begin to use the fight drugs. These are a dozen different drugs for specific aggressive action. They chew the roots of albizia. When they have chased animals that run quickly or the bark of the acacia when they chase a lion, they drink an infusion of a kind of mimosa when they prepare themselves to battle with other tribes. They have specific acacias in bladders that hang off the trees. So when a young Maasai warrior at 12 years old is given a bag of food and a spear, he goes to the bag and he drinks the acacia brew that has the MAO inhibitor in it. And he drinks and he drinks and he drinks and he drinks until his eyes roll back in his head and then he dances. He does the numba. The numba is where you may have seen them jumping in the air like this. And they're jumping in the air like this. And then they jump into the air, and when he comes down, he runs out into the plane and kills a lion, or he doesn't come back. They have occasions for lion fighting. This is the lion fighting bag, guys. When you go to kill a lion, drink out that bag. This bag over here, guys, this one's for hand-to-hand -hand combat with another human being. Drink that one if you're going to fight somebody. We're getting ready to run 80 kilometers. This is the bag to drink, guys. So they have specific fight drugs, just like at MIT, they're putting together the, the Soldier of the Future program where they're genetically manipulating and they're utilizing certain fight drugs, gene splicing into human beings, leopard genes and wolf genes to create an aggressive soldier that will not have fear. This technology was on the African continent millennia ago. So what I'm gonna do real quick, go to the first slide. Ayahuasca and other plants on the earth, including salvia and others, are earthbound plants. They have an agenda. Save the rainforest, save the whales, don't cut us down, don't burn us out, don't tractor us. Psilocybin doesn't have that agenda. Psilocybin is an off-world, hyper-organic technology. It is part of the span, uh, panspermia program of the intra-extra trans-dimensional beings that created it for knowledge and information. LSD was created in 1930 by Albert Hoffman. It's a great compound. But it does not have the plenum of information in it that psilocybin has in it. It only has the plenum of information that has been put in it since 1930 when he created it, and this morning when some of, or last night when some of you dropped some acid. It only has those experiences, but psilocybin has the experiences of millions and millions and millions of galaxies and years and things in it. It is the Akashic records. It is the records of this galaxy and beyond. And uh, since I only have five more minutes, run through a, a couple of those slides real quick. This is the area that we're talking about uh, first encountering. Uh, when the Sahara was green, today it's a great desert. But when it was green, when it had great rivers, tributaries, streams, lakes, and things like that, people lived all around there. When it dried up and the mushrooms dried up, they went to the only available water source that was, and that was the Nile Valley. And, it, and this same mushroom, the disillusion of it is what created Kemet, or what was called Egypt, because the Egyptian Pantheon was built on one family and how they chose to clothe themselves in reality. And that was the family of Ra. That's why you have Ansar and Aset, Nebhed, and all of the other classical Egyptian Neturu or deities. Where you have a man with a bird's head or a man with a, uh, the head of a uh, Anubis, which is a, uh, yes, yes. 
So you have all of those classical entities inside of this realm. And it was built upon sacred plants. It was built upon the acacia, the blue, the blue lotus. It was built on also the blue tamarian mushroom. Uh, hit the, hit the, this is the relationship with cattle. And I wanted to go into the uh, Rajvita, the Upanishads, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, and dealing with Soma. And I heard that they had a lecture on Soma. And uh, the only thing that lines up culturally with this in dealing with the whole Indian pantheon is the blue mushroom. Because that is what is, is associated with the cow. The cow is the cow dung for burning, ghee for food and anointing, the cow being sacred. Because the mushroom comes from the cow, that's what makes it sacred, along not just the milk. And the Maasai are cattle herders. Those in, uh, in India in ancient times were, they revered the cow. You didn't, and that was because of what came from the cow and that was the blue mushroom. So I'm of the opinion that if not fully that originally, some of the constituents are still in there as far as mushroom concern. I'm gonna go. Two, two minutes. Run through, the, run through the slides quickly. Keep going, keep going. Just keep going. Keep going. But keep going. We're going to give them a visual array. Hold it right there. Come back. Okay, here. This is the ceremony of the opening of the mouth. You see the table of the food of the gods. You have mushroom caps. The mushroom caps, the caps are female. The, ma the male portion is the stem. We can't go into this. This is the little house of life here. You see the door in the house with the pyramid on top. We can't go into that. You see Osiris in the back in his mushroom form up at the top with his hat on and things like that. That's the mushroom glyph. Keep going. Okay, hold it. This is a sand painting that they use in Tibet. <laughs> These are places. These are technologies. They're utilized with entheogens. They put, it, they put these, this through an algorithm and said three-dimensionalize this. Go ahead. Forward. One more. And this is what they came up with once they three-dimensionalized the two-dimensional sand painting, which they did. And it's the same thing with the Navajo and the Hopi in the United States. These are places of learning. Keep going. Okay, hold it. The magic carpet. The red in the carpet is Syrian root. These carpets were held by families for thousands of years because this is a place of learning and a place of deposit depositing mnemonic uh, uh, knowledge. Up in the corner, that's where your ancestors live. So when you take your entheogen, you put your carpet down, you fly on the carpet into the same technology that's three-dimensionalized, you fly into that, and that's where you go and visit your ancestors. The training for young people is on this side, and on and on and on and on and on. Each curl, each curve, three-dimensionalized is a different place. Go again. That's just talking about Syrian rule, go again. Hold it. That's the Cenobite puzzle box. Puzzles, labyrinths, and things like that are all part of the technology. I can give you 15 grams of mushrooms, and if you've seen the movie Hellraiser, Pinhead, and the rest of them will come out of this box. If you haven't seen Hellraiser, you don't know what I'm talking about. But those who have know what I'm talking about. A friend of mine who takes uh, high doses of mushrooms, he has one from the toy store that when he takes the entheogens, this thing starts doing the same thing that it does in the movie. Changing, twisting, going up, going down, and stuff starts coming out of it. Next, keep going. Okay, keep going. Okay, hold it. This is Ansar. Wasir, Osiris, the lord of the underworld, master of the dead, in his mushroom form. If you see the mushroom in there, disregard the crook and fail, flail, disregard the <laughs> folds in the back. Just look at the shape. This is the mushroom glyph in metal nature, or in the, what you call the hieroglyph. Move to the next slide. I just put this side by side so that you could see. This is the secret of Kemet. This is the secret of Egypt. This is the secret of how they, they dealt with death. Keep going, quickly. Circle within a circle, go back. Circle within a circle. This is the underside of a mushroom cap. Next slide. 
I'm in Ra. Ra circle within the circle because this is how Ra and his family chose to uh, clothe themselves in reality. And when the pre-dynastic comedic priesthood went into the hyperdimensional realms and saw pyramids and Tekken and Ben Ben stones and temples in light, when they came out of their particular sojourn, they then came upon the earth and made out of stone what they saw in light in the hyperdimensional realms. So these are things that were built out of the compendium of information that is in the mushroom realm. When you see those ancient temples, those are copies of the temples that are in the hyperdimensional realms that you get to when you go on the high dose. Move. Thank you. These are ear studs. Seeing some of the guys walking around with ear studs? These are ear, mushroom ear studs from Egypt, from Kemet, and it shows that they knew all of the different hallucinogenic plant uh, uh, fungi in their area. Keep going, quick. Pineal gland. Great cow, keep going. Uh, Hator, we, we can't go into this, keep going. <laughs> keep going, keep going. Dung beetle, hold it. The majority of dung beetles feed on dung, both in their adult and larval phase. However, many dung beetles feed on a variety of things, including mushrooms. Next. The dung beetle takes the dung from the cows, from the camels, from the elephants, rolls it into a ball, pushes it with his hind legs, and that's the sun being pushed across the horizon. But the mushrooms come out of the dung beetle. It's the sac one of the sacred symbols of ancient Kemet. It is called Kepera, or the self-begotten. This is Wasir, Osiris, Ansar in the veiled form. If you know about mushrooms, the veil tears away, but the veil is connected here. Keep going, we can't go through, keep going. Forward, 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 forward. Keep hitting the button. Keep moving, keep going. There's a lot of slides, but these will get into your subconscious. Keep going. Okay, hold it. <clears throat> this is the underside. This is, of course, a spore print. Keep going. This is, of course, uh, Jesus. Of course, that's me. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> I wanted to get into the. I wanted to get into the uh, uh, Buddhism, but keep going. You know, I wanted to get into some of the uh, other things. This is the uh, go back Lingham and the Yoni, but it's the mushroom stem and cap and you know, if you're a guy and you get to the right spot, you can have all those virgins. Keep going. Keep going. Uh, Persephonis and, uh, Persephone and Demeter. The Anisis, keep going. <coughs> keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. It, uh, yep, Alice in Wonderland, of course. Keep going. <laughs> Pop Smurf. Amanita, keep going. I want to get back to the, to the back of the slides. Keep going. Okay, that's the whole Catholic thing in there. Connection to the Amanita Mascara mushroom. They have it. You know, keep going, uh, keep going. That's, uh, hold it, hold it, come back. All the steeples on top of those churches are pine trees because, keep going, one more, because the mushroom glyph is always there. That's the stem and the cap of the mushroom because that's what analogy is and it's under the Christmas tree. It's under the pine tree. They deal with the Amanita muscari mushroom, keep going. That's Notre Dame, same thing, mushroom glyph. That's the circle within the circle with the lines radiating out. Keep going. I want to get to the back part where the African masks are. <laughs> Just keep going through. Hold it, hold it. Come back, come back, come back, come back. <clears throat> That's there in the Vatican, the mushroom, uh, you know, fountain. Go forward. Hari, hari. Keep going. This is all. Um, keep going. Forward. Buddha, Buddhism, Hinduism. The foundation, standing on the mushroom, keep going. I hold it, Hanuman, the hero of the Ramayana, and Angi holding their mushrooms. This is all part of it. If you're talking about Soma, and you're talking about the divine sovereign yoga of Krishna and Rama, you're talking about mushrooms. You're not talking about something else. Keep going. We can't, we can't go into all of this, so you can catch me later on forward. Uh, that was a Huru Mazda. I know folks think Mazda was a car, but it was the um, supreme deity of the Zoroastrians. That's Zachariah Siskin. Go back two or three. Okay, uh, he's dealing with the making of the uh, of human beings with the Anunnaki. Anunnaki in the back with the mushroom shape. Go forward. 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 
Okay, attributes of Shango Ho. Shango is the, in the Yoruba Pantheon. He is the god of thunder. The thunder priests in Nigeria go up and sing the songs and stand on the mountain and get struck by lightning because they're calling down the lightning, which brings out the mushrooms from the ground with the rain and the, and the thunder and lightning. But he has the same attributes as go forward, as Thor forward. That's Marvel's version. That's the more traditional version of Thor. The hammer and the axe are mushroom symbols. Go forward. Go forward. This is just your brain and your brain on psilocybin, stuff like that. These are the compounds. You know about that. Um, that's the um, cascading effect from, uh, uh, you know, serotonin through pinealine and all the other things. You, you know, they'll talk about that later on. Safety profile. Okay, hey, hold it. Safety profile. Psilocybin has a high LD50. That's lethal dose 50. Lethal dose 50 is how much of any compound you can feed to a rat before it kills. Uh, if you take 100 rats, how, many, how much of a compound you can feed before it kills 50 of them. Psilocybin has a high LD50. You have to eat your body weight in psilocybin in one setting to kill yourself. So you can eat 10 pounds of psilocybin and not kill yourself. That's what is different about it than any other of the uh, entheogens. <laughs> You're not gonna kill yourself. Now, that doesn't mean sit on the edge of the roof while you're eating it, you know, because you may fall off. But that has to do with navigation and balance. It doesn't have anything to do with the compound itself. And it can, of course, be psychologically challenging. Go forward. Got a couple of seconds. You know, you know these guys. Hold it, go back, Easter Island. You're looking at what built Easter Island. It was the mushroom. You think, the way you look at the st statue at Easter Island, it, it's not the head. It's the secret behind the head, what built the heads, what gave them the ability to lift the heads and move the heads into position. And that knowledge came from and through the mushroom. Go forward. Forward, forward, forward. This is all South America because this is a full program here. Try to hold, go back. These are the mushroom wands. These are held by men and women of power in West Africa, and the mushroom is there. If you look inside of the head, you have the stem, and you have the cap of the mushrooms that are symbolizing the knowledge that is embedded inside of the mushroom that built the society. In Africa, you can go, we have what's called the fractal transdimensional village. You go to the village, and you'll see people there, and you know they may have on tattered clothes, and you know living in a hut, and things like that. But those people aren't there. They're someplace else. They're in another village. They're in the hyperdimensional village. Can't go into that now. Move forward. These are uh, African hole. Go, 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 hole. Right there. Oh, come back one. Okay, come back one. Go forward one. Go forward. Right there. Good. This one shows explicitly the mushroom with the stem and the cap as the forehead on the leopard mass. Go forward. Forward, forward. Go forward again, forward again, forward again, forward again. These are, go back, this is scarification. Um, they even scar mushrooms into the priest and priestesses in Africa. Go forward. Uh, pyramids built on mushrooms, we ain't gonna get into that. Okay, um, I think she's cutting me down. Uh, maybe we have a chance for a couple of questions, hopefully. Yeah, I think um, I'm sure people have a lot of questions and uh, we've got time for maybe one or two while I set up the next speaker. Mm -hmm. So you can, if you don't get a chance to ask them, you can save them and ask them later. And I'm sure Kalindi would be happy to chat with you. Of course. Yeah. All the any explicit written accounts, especially in ancient Egypt, was very well embedded in English language classes that symbolism can be found where that's true. Um, uh, the thing about Africa is that when they say a secret, they don't talk about it as secret. They don't have the same sensibilities. Uh, just says nothing has to be proved. You have to take the dose and experience the experience. And that's where you get the validation from, uh, not from the literature. The literature is something that is not, uh, uh, it's a modern thing. Oral tradition is what Africa is built upon. And so through the oral tradition and through the actual 
uh, apprenticeship program, that's where you get your validation from. So if you're looking for them to say, we were sitting around eating mushrooms, they're not going to say it. But uh, take 20 grams and look at the, uh, the, the actual literature, and I, I think you'll ha uh, we'll have a different opinion. Uh, one more, I guess. Anybody else? I said all that stuff and nobody has one question? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Well, the protocol is a program where the, the master teaches the apprentice. They, um, you pattern yourself and you assist what the master is doing, whether it be warfare, whether it be in the um, pharmacological uh, vocations, you pattern what your teacher does. If uh, you learn the different plants and fauna and flora in the area uh, by going out and the teacher showing you what particular plants is, then they tell you, go out and get this plant. Go out and find it. They'll tell you the char characteristics of the uh, the places that it grows. You know, this grows next to the river. This grows on the mountain. This one grows uh, close to caves and things like that. And you learn through doing along with uh, along with your teacher. And then your teacher then extends you out to be able to go more and more on your own until you uh, you know are independent and you know uh, you can do it yourself. And it's the same thing with the Enthians. They start out, they watch you the first couple of times to make sure you don't do nothing silly. Like, you know, I can fly or something like that. And once they, once you, once they find out you're not going to do anything silly, and more important, once you find out you're not going to do anything silly, then they just load you up and you go for yourself. And that's, how they, uh, how, that's the protocol on how they do it. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. I'll be on the panel. You can catch me in the hallway.